Considered to be the intellectual capital of the world, Athens, Greece. And the dumbest thing that could ever be done was normally practiced in Athens, the intellectual capital of the world. For in Athens, men worship gods of their own making. And you should never worship anything you made. And uh, uh, Athens' um, human intellect ruled the day. Acts 17, 32 through 34 says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some, the Athenians here, mocked. Others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men cleaved unto him and believed among the which was Diocese, the Aropagite, and a woman named Dimerus, and others with them. Just a handful responded favorably to Paul's preaching. In Athens. Um, in his book, Exploring Acts, John Phillips wrote this about the Athenians' improper response to the gospel. He said, Paul's preaching at Athens produced little results. What happened at Athens is confirmed by all human history. And here's what human history has confirmed. The gospel does not make its greatest impact among those who are wise after the flesh. Athenians was, Athens, excuse me, was the home of criticism where everything was brought, brought before the bar of human intellect. Weighed and found wanting. In that city of philosophers, there was little room for Christianity. Indeed, no great church would be founded in Athens during the first 300 years of Christianity. There has not been a many moves of God in Athens because the city rejected God's truth. The same holds true of the city of Nazareth. John G. Butler wrote this about Nazareth and its improper response to the gospel. He wrote, he writes, after this bit of savage conduct toward Christ, when they took Jesus out of the temple, and we've read it in the text, and took him out of town and tried to throw him off the cliff. It says this savage conduct, he not surprisingly left Nazareth. The city that had been rejected, that had rejected, excuse me, great spiritual privilege was rejected from divine blessing. When they rejected the privilege of having Jesus there to preach, they were rejected of God. It is instructive that what has been found by archaeologists of this ancient city of Nazareth indicates that it never developed into, the, into much of a city. It may have at one time been significant uh, a place where crossroads, where the roads cross, where travelers met. But Nazareth, after it rejected Jesus, 
disintegrated into insignificance. One cannot help but see all of this as God's judgment upon Nazareth for their rejecting Christ. Nazareth was on its way up. but When it rejected the word of God, it drifted into insignificance. And it hasn't been anything since. Psalms 9 and 17 said, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Why are you marching for women's rights to kill the unborn baby while the NAACP is calling for a state boycott of our, of North Carolina because they want men to be able to use the bathrooms that women use. Y'all watch these words, transgender and all that. They ain't but two genders. They ain't but two sexes. No. You either have a biblical worldview or not. God made the human race male and female. A man can cut off what he wants, tuck this, nip that, and uh, do whatever. After he finished doing all that, will you swab his mouth? The DNA still says man. You can't change. You can mutilate yourself, but you can't change yourself, my brother, into a woman. You can't do that. And sisters, you can't change yourself into a man. You can mess yourself up. You can pretty much guarantee that you'll never get married to a man. But you can't change yourself into a man. A man can mutilate his body. And after he's finished, never be, a never be able to father children. Never be able to uh, experience life the way God wanted him to. But he can never make himself into a woman. God made them ish and isha. Ish. Male. Isha. Female. And that's it. That's it. And yet today in a world of lies. In a world of make believe. We're told to pretend. We're told to participate. In a charade, we look at men who have put on wigs and refer to him as her. Shame on you for even being a willing to, uh, participant. Uh, your mind ought to be stronger than that. Common sense ought to tell you better. Children know better. Praise the Lord. Spot, the dog, knows better. Yes. But what you don't get, and, and Brother Wooden is going to tell you what's happening. You are, you, are, you are witnessing the rejection of the Bible. See, because when you see people talk about to how people can change their genders and you can't judge this or that, well, who is the one who said that stuff couldn't be done? The Bible. Where do you find God made them male and God made them female at? In the Bible. Where do you find that homosexuality, lesbianism, uh, transgenderism, bestiality, adultery, fornication, and all those things are wrong. What book tells you those things? The Bible. So when people begin to endorse lifestyles that contradict the Bible, the truth is they are rejecting the Bible. And when you're saved, you don't reject the Bible. When you had, a, had an experience with the Lord, you don't reject the Bible. Every nation will be turning to hell that rejects God. How we respond to God's truth determines how the Lord responds to us. In Matthew's gospel chapter 11, verse 15, we find our Lord saying this. He that hath an ear or hath ears to hear, let him hear. That is, when the Lord said that, he said, pay attention. Don't miss the importance and the significance of what you are hearing. I say, upper room, hear me. Pay attention. And do not sit there with a spirit of strife and debate. 
as I preach to you, don't you sit there and argue in my mind, in your mind. Say, well, well, I heard this, that, and the other. I'm preaching God's truth. And when God's truth is being preached, listen, listen, listen. You get rid of the distractions around you. Praise the Lord. Keep the children quiet. Don't be tapping nobody on the shoulders. We, this is not the time to talk and play and joke around. How about getting the gum out your mouth because you can't hear for smacking so loud. You need to hear what's being said. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Mark's Gospel chapter 4 verse 9, we find our Lord saying, he, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. How we respond to God's truth to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the preaching and, and the teaching of God's word is crucial. I'm almost done. November 20th, 1977. November 20th, 1977. November the 20th, 1977. In the 77, the president was Jimmy Carter. The unemployment rate was 7.1%. The average cost of a gallon of gas was 65 cents. It was high. <laughs> the number one pop song, the number one song in America was the Bee Gees. How deep is your love? <laughs> Jesus Christ is the way was among the top gospel songs during that time by the late Edwin Hawkins. Andre Crouch was still enjoying success from his 1976 release of This Is Another Day. The Mighty Clouds of Joy had two albums released that year. One was entitled Truth Is The Power and the other was live and direct. November the 20th, or better known as the third Sunday in November, or the Sunday before Thanksgiving, turned out to be next to my birth date, the most important day of my life. I didn't know it then, but everything that would follow in my life would be affected by how I responded to the gospel that day almost 40 years ago. Matter of fact, 39 years and two months. Yes, sir. On that day at 104 South Stewart Street, on the 11 a.m. service at the Temple Church of God in Christ in Rockingham, North Carolina. Around 11 and 11.15, a tall man, the late great James Henry Turner, some six feet three or so inches tall, walked into the sanctuary, having gotten a word from the Lord. Earlier that day, I don't know, maybe it was Deacon Cameron, could have been Deacon Waddell, Celia, or maybe Deacon uh, Tillman. The deacons had opened up the church. That week, Linda Tillman and uh, Debbie and the choir had practiced their songs. Thank you, Jesus. Sometime that morning, Mother Williams, Mother Baldwin, all of the church mothers had prayed the prayer for the service. My mama talked me into going to church. I didn't know that that day would be the day, praise the Lord, that would change my life. Pastor preached and the invitation was given. My entire future rests upon that decision from whom and when I married to which college I would attend, to where I would work, to being called or even not called into the ministry. 
to become a preacher, a pastor, a superintendent, a doctor, and a bishop in the church where I would live. The birth of my children, my grandchildren in this ministry, so forth and so on, rested upon my response to the word of God that day. I heard Satan say, after the preacher opened the prayer line, the devil spoke to me and said, don't go up there. Satan said, get up and go to the end of the pew, make a right turn, and exit the church. See, because when I entered the church, from facing, from the door facing the pulpit, I sat on the right, on the left. Mid to the back of the church, midway into the pew. There I sat, and the preacher preached, and I was convicted. The devil said, leave. One of my cousins was sitting beside me, and she got up. She said, Pat, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going out. And I'll be honest with you, when she got up and left, I got up to leave with her. But by the providence of God, Instead of turning right to exit the church, I turned left and found myself standing in the prayer line. We had a prayer line in those days. You can't have that now because folk don't give you that much time to have church. So you have to pray fast, one prayer, and hope everybody get it. <laughs> so there I stand on the third Sunday in November in the year 1977, 16 years old, not knowing that everything at 16 was in the balance. Can I get a witness? While standing there in line, I saw the pastor laying hands on people. I saw people, praise the Lord, falling out. I said to myself, I'm not going to fall out. Said to myself, I'm not going to move when he touched me. I had played football and was on the wrestling team, so I knew how to balance myself. I knew how to stay upright, praise the Lord. And I had, while waiting my turn, argued and persuaded myself that I was not going to be moved. I'm preaching about properly responding to the word of God. And while I stood there, I didn't know that God was smarter than man. Hallelujah. And I didn't understand how God could operate in a man of God. Finally, it was my turn. I won't lie, my heart was beating 100 miles a minute. Praise the Lord. Sweat began to pour from my brow. But I said to myself, I'm not falling. I will not respond. And my pastor looked at me. He wasn't the pastor at the time. It was the first time I'd ever seen him. He said, young man, the Lord told me not to lay hands on you. I hadn't figured on that one. He said, the Lord told me to tell you to get on your knee and talk to God for yourself. I said, Lord, have mercy. What am I going to do with this? I got down on my knees November the 20th, 1977. Praise the Lord. The gospel had been preached. And I'm preaching about properly responding to the word of God. Got down on my knees and I said, save me, Jesus. And you know what happened. Nothing happened. I felt nothing. Praise the Lord. I felt nothing. Nothing. But I heard a voice say, ask me and mean it. And uh, I got serious there for a minute and I said save me Jesus and I felt the Holy Spirit I felt something began to move on the inside some almost 40 years ago November the 20th 1977 I'm preaching about properly responding to God's word and uh, when I felt the power I said I've got to get away from this because I've never felt anything that felt like that. 
So I got up to leave. And you know, I told you I'd been on the wrestling team. And for those who wrestled, you understand that wrestling is a, praise the Lord, a pressure sport. Wrestlers learn where people's pressure points are and how you can control someone. Uh, and one of the points of control is the wrist. And uh, I'm trying to get up and somebody grabbed me by my right wrist and snatched me around. My carnal mind said that these people can't make me get saved. They can't make me accept Jesus. And I'm getting ready to tell somebody off of snatching me around on November the 20th, 1977 at the Temple Church of God in Christ. Praise the Lord. I'm preaching about properly responding to God's word. And uh, when I got snatched around, I opened my eyes to see who pulled on me. I looked at Elder Turner and the pastor had his hand laid on someone else. He was praying for someone else. And the only person standing there paying any attention to me was the late great Mother Williams. And Mother was standing with her hands like this, praying for me. So I heard a voice said, I am the Lord. And you can't get away from me. At that point, on November the 20th, 1977, praise the Lord, I broke and I gave into the God of the Bible and here I stand today I can hardly wait for November the 19th 2017 for then I will be 40 years old in Jesus Christ I thank God that I responded properly to his word somebody lift your hands and tell the Lord thank you Ever since then, I've been getting a steady dose of the gospel and of God's instructions. Praise the Lord. Sometimes up and sometimes down. Sometimes strong, hopefully most of the time, and sometimes weak. But all the time, I've been blessed. Hallelujah. More than I ever thought and more than I ever realized. Good God Almighty, there were other sinners in the temple that day who heard the same message that I did, who was given the same opportunity. Amen. They heard the same invitation. Praise the Lord. They were in the same church. Jesus died for them as he died for me, but they refused the gospel. They walked away from the Lord. Praise the Lord. They weren't ready. And many of them went into judgment. Many of them are dead. And they never got saved. But uh, their loss was my gain. Praise the Lord. It all boiled down to how we responded to what we've heard. I want to know how do you respond when you hear God's truth? What do you do? Do you reject it or do you accept it? I mentioned Mother Williams. I mentioned Deacon Cameron. I mentioned Deacon Waddell and the others. I mentioned the choir. Why? Because they, upper room, helped create the atmosphere. Oh, I'm glad that the deacons were a good amen corner. I'm glad that the choir sang a song and the congregation got with it. I'm glad that Sunday morning the folk weren't all funky and mean, praise the Lord, and distant and wouldn't speak and wasn't nice and they wouldn't get with the preacher. I'm glad they did not say amen, but I'm glad that the church was on fire. Why? Because they created an atmosphere. I felt the power of God as I sat there in that church. I wonder today, what are you doing to help the atmosphere of this service? There may be someone else, 16. There may be another Patrick Wooden here today who's lost and listless, who is ragged, tattered, battered, and torn, who need Jesus Christ. But I wonder what are they feeling as they sit beside you? Do they feel the power good God Almighty are there do they feel your amazement or are you sitting there with resentment and with anger I wonder today who has the joy of the Lord and what's radiating from you today you ought to let the praises go because somebody here needs to be saved we ought to create an atmosphere where a young man can come up and say, I want to be saved. 
by the power of God. Lift your hands and say yeah. Yes! You ought to look at the person on either side of you and praise the Lord. Just look at them and wonder. You ought to wonder out loud and say, can you feel it? Can you feel the power? Mm. See, if you have the power, somebody else ought to be able to feel the power. If you've been washed in the blood, someone else ought to be able to tell it sometime. Oh, Lord. See, when you come to church, you don't just come for yourself. You can't just sit there and act like I'm not on the law. But when you hear the word, maybe you had a bad day. When you hear the word, maybe you wasn't feeling good. But when you hear the word, you got to get with the word. Look at our text. When Jesus finished preaching, even in his hometown, they responded the wrong way. They got mad. They put him out of the sanctuary. They put him out of the temple. They put him out, excuse me, of the synagogue. And then after they put him out of the synagogue, they put him out of the city. Saints, you are not a you ought not put Jesus out of your mind. You ought not push Jesus out of your heart because you could push him away and he never come again. Good God Almighty, but you ought to reach up to Jesus and say, Lord, you are welcome. You're welcome to stay in me. You're welcome to live in me. Good Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. They got mad in Nazareth. They took Jesus to the edge of the city. Look at their response to the Lord. They responded with savagery. They responded with racism. They responded with anger. They got mad because Jesus said that God could bless the Gentiles just as good as God can bless the Jews. I wonder who will get glad when I say that God can bless someone else just as good as he can bless you. I wonder would you give the Lord a praise for somebody else's blessing. Some of us can't praise the Lord until the Lord is blessing us. But if you really want to be blessed, learn how to get happy for someone else. Get happy for somebody else's car. Get happy for someone else's home. Get happy for someone else's blessing. You ought to praise the Lord for his blessings on your neighbor. Bless the Lord for somebody else's child. And if you Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.